Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and before we get started on tonight's story, I'm going to let you know about Shudder. Shudder is the best selection of horror, thriller, and supernatural movies, series, and originals, from Hollywood favorites and cult classics to acclaimed new movies you won't find anywhere else. Always streaming uncut and commercial-free. And this month till Halloween, Shudder will be celebrating their largest lineup of new shows and titles for their Home for Halloween celebration. Now through October 31st, sink your teeth into Shudder's biggest slate of must-see originals and new movies. Get in on all the scares with Shudder's expertly curated collection, including must-see titles like 101 Scariest Horror Movie Moments of All Time, Queer for Fear, The History of Queer Horror, VHS 94, Deadstream, Dark Glasses, plus a new series from Bullet Brothers spin-off series. And I really have to recommend Deadstream. A lot of my friends have been talking about it. They've been telling me to watch it, and I have to recommend it to you guys. A disgraced and demonetized internet personality tries to win back his fans by live streaming himself, spending a night alone in an abandoned haunted house. However, when he accidentally unleashes a vengeful spirit, his big comeback event becomes a real-time fight for his life, and for social relevance. As he faces off with the sinister spirit of the house and her powerful following, Deadstream stars Joseph Winter, who wrote and directed the film with Vanessa Winter, and it is a Shudder original. It is hilarious, it is really fun, and I mean, hey, it hits close to home. So try Shudder for free for 30 days, and go over to Shudder.com and use promo code CREEPYPASTA, that's all one word, and that's Shudder, S-H-U-D-D-E-R, dot com, and the promo code CREEPYPASTA, just like you see on your screen. I have to thank Shudder so much for helping me out on this month, which is probably the most difficult October we've had to deal with. So a huge thank you to Shudder. I'd really love for you guys to give them a chance. And now, on to tonight's story. Last year, Bloody Disgusting gave it 4 out of 5 screams. Fangoria Magazine touted it as the most original haunted concept on the market. But, you shouldn't believe the reviews. No. Really, don't, okay? Full Moon Flights is not what it seems. According to the brochure, they are a modern haunted house for fans of fear, a departure from the ordinary and a journey into the unknown where nightmares are inescapable. Quote, we don't allow guests to book flights. Instead, we let those who have the courage and curiosity to come find us. Unquote, the blurb. Everything about it screams a publicity stunt to me, you know. Private jetliner filled with costumed actors, jump scares designed to give people an adrenaline rush all night long. The latest event was this Halloween near me, and since I couldn't think of a better way to spend the evening, I decided to take a drive out to the provided coordinates where the plane was said to land. Departure time was scheduled for precisely 12.01 a.m., so I got there early, intent on documenting each and every aspect of the experience. Besides myself, there were about six other cars parked at an old airstrip, a fitting place for the spooky flight to land, I thought, as I looked about the dilapidated buildings. No one had used this place in a very long time, if ever. I grabbed my cell and small backpack filled with emergency supplies and gear, everything that I thought I would need for the night, but then, from the looks of some of the other patrons' gear, it seemed I was the one underprepared. First time? A woman wearing a Freddy Krueger shirt asked as she offered me a small capsule. Uh, yeah. What's this for? I asked. Helps keep your head in the game. For a little while, anyway, she said, as she stared up at the sky. Guess they want to be fashionably late, like usual. How many times have you been a passenger? I asked. I remembered reading that some claimed the event had staff hidden amongst the guests to try and boost interest, so everything she told me I took with a grain of salt at first. Five times? Maybe six? It's a hell of a ride, I'll tell you what, she answered, as she extended her hand and added, I'm Isabella, nice to meet you. Max, same here. When are they supposed to arrive? I asked, noticing the other passengers were getting antsy. I couldn't see any signs of a plane in the sky. I wonder what sort of showy entrance the proprietor had in mind to dazzle us. Don't know, these things are unpredictable. She lit a smoke and wandered towards the other passengers. She tried to sell you one of those pills too, eh? A man with an Australian accent asked as I looked down at my palm where the red and white tablet was at. Is it some kind of hallucinogenic? I whispered. Don't know, mate, but I personally wouldn't risk it. This night's probably going to be crazy enough as it is, he told me. You came all the way from around the world just for this? I asked. 
He didn't respond, but his eyes showed a story of pain and heartache. He was searching for something, but didn't dare disclose what. The others were not as fascinating. Two twins from Manchester were here for a birthday present to each other, and a couple of young reporters finished up our group. Considering the price of tickets for the event, I knew that to get their money's worth, they all expected an extreme fright. Twenty minutes passed, and the flight still hadn't arrived, so the taller twin, Tanya, started to make a fuss. This is so unprofessional, she said, as she walked toward the wide hangar bay. I gathered she was hoping to find someone to complain to, and it was the first time I noticed that we were the only ones here. I had read online the flights were always packed to the gills, so why were there only six of us? What do you suppose is going on? Isabella asked. She wasn't as chatty either. In fact, the whole group seemed on edge as we followed Tanya to the other side of the airfield. Even the wind had stopped blowing. Something about the night just seemed even more sinister. As we turned to go back towards where we had parked, a sharp burst of air pierced the darkness, and all of us felt it nearly knock us down. Tom and the Aussie lost his hat and actually tumbled over as I looked up and saw the large passenger plane seemingly appear out of nowhere. It was about the size of a Delta Airline jetliner, with at least the capacity of 150 passengers or more, and painted entirely black to match the dark sky. A rumble of thunder crackled across the backdrop of the plane as I noted there were only a few windows and only one entrance, further showing that they intended for you to have an immersive experience once aboard. I knew it hadn't been there moments ago. Now all of a sudden, it had landed. The ramp to the first class seating area was already lowered, as though they had been the ones waiting for us rather than the other way around. Isabella gave me a nudge and said nervously, Told you they know how to make an entrance. I nodded and grabbed my things heading towards the plane as I spotted one of the stewardesses gathering luggage from the other passengers. Tom was the first in line, eager to be aboard. Welcome, Mr. Bradley. Always a pleasure having you flying with us, the pale blonde employee said. Her face looked so perfect I half thought she was robotic. So pristine and exact. Tom became red in the face, apparently not anticipating that they would give away his apparent frequent flyer status, and then dashed up the steps to find a seat before any of us had a chance to open a conversation about it. Do you have your tickets? The stewardess asked, focusing on the twins next. Riley, the shorter one, took them out of her pocket, and both of them eagerly entered without much fanfare. I was next. Welcome, Mr. Declan. I see you came prepared this time, the stewardess said as I took out my ticket. I gave her a look of confusion. This is my first time, I told her. The stewardess didn't blink as she ripped the ticket and told me, Of course it is. Yes. I must have confused you with someone else. I didn't bother asking any more questions, as I figured it was probably part of the show and boarded the plane as well. At the front, before the first class cabin area, two more blonde stewardesses that looked almost identical to the one that I had seen outside greeted me outside the pilot's chamber and offered me a warm drink, which resembled some sort of raspberry tonic. Before we take off, we recommend all passengers drink this mixture. It will prevent any sort of nausea or displacement, the first woman told me. I knew it was likely they wouldn't let me board unless I downed the concoction, so I downed it hurriedly and then pushed open the curtains to look at the interior of the cabin. Much to my surprise, it looked like an ordinary jetliner would with rows of compartments above the seats for luggage and about five seats on either side of the aisle, most of which were empty. I checked my stub to see where I was supposed to sit. Economy, row C. Seat 3. The Aussie was the only other one of us in first class, and I almost envied his deep pockets, wondering if his experience would be entirely different from my own. Back in economy, I immediately felt a bit more cramped and claustrophobic, especially due to the dim lighting. Was that for aesthetics, I wondered, as I moved to my seat and noted I was near a window. A window that appeared to be sealed shut. A moment later, an Asian businessman appeared from the curtain and nodded, sitting down next to me. Did you get here late? I asked, not recalling him in the crowd outside. He responded in his native tongue and took the seat beside me, nervously fidgeting with his wedding ring as more passengers boarded. Bloody hell, where are all these people coming from? I asked, noticing a whole family pass us to go to third class. I reached over to my window to try to see if maybe a large group had shown up at the last minute, but then Isabella reached from the row behind me and kept me from opening it. I wouldn't do that if I were you, 
she warned. I snatched my hand away, tired of her games, and pulled the shutter to the window up anyway. The airfield didn't look familiar anymore. Instead, it seemed as though we had landed somewhere in a busy city district like Hong Kong or Seoul. Nowhere near the same rustic countryside of Midwest America. What the hell? I whispered as Isabel shut it back. We're about to take off. Trust me, you want these closed, she warned. This time, I decided to listen. Another stewardess appeared near the front of the cabin and grabbed a small speaker connected to the compartment beside her to give us a few guidelines. I couldn't help but notice how the plane was seemingly packed full of people. Good evening. On behalf of all of us here at Full Moon Flights, we'd like to thank you again for joining us on this amazing journey. The captain has turned on the fasten seatbelt sign at this time as we go over a few instructions in the event of emergency, she said in a sing-song voice. Honestly, she seemed a bit too chipper given the information she next presented. As you may have noticed during your arrival, there are no emergency exits or equipment aboard the flight. We had optimized the cabin to be entirely for the experience into the unknown. That being said, should we encounter any unanticipated turbulence, we ask all passengers to remain seated. The safest bet for us to reach our destination will be your full cooperation in these circumstances. Can't believe what I was hearing, especially how dangerous it sounded. I heard one man behind me cuss profusely as the stewardesses next explained there was no emergency oxygen on the airline either. Rest assured that what you will be dealing with tonight will take your breath away, but if you can face it, you will get to your destination as intended, she said as she finished her announcement, and then disappeared to the front of the plane. Something about the way she spoke made me very uneasy. Her choice of words felt intentionally vague. A clamor of gossip stirred as we all wondered what the hell we signed up for. That must be to just get us nervous, a young girl said a few rows up. I heard they intentionally make this intense before the show starts, another man said. It made me a little calmer to hear these rumors swirl around, but I still had no idea what I expected. Behind me, Isabella squeezed my shoulder and muttered, Buckle up, Max. I obeyed her and listened as a new voice came over the intercom. This one was gruff and sounded distorted, almost inhuman. Is your captain speaking? We're T-minus three minutes to take off. Not sure why... But the succinct way he spoke, coupled with the way my stomach was twisting into a knot, made me very uneasy. There was no turning back. No escape, I realized. Then, the plane began to move. Instinctively, I gripped the seat cushion as I felt the engines begin to roar and the plane shake and pick up speed. The Asian businessman next to me did the same, closing his eyes and seemingly chanting. Was he praying? I could hear the wheels skid against the runway and the noise grew louder as I was pushed into the seat a bit by the thrust of the engines. And then we began to ascend. The roar got louder as I looked about at some of the other passengers to see their reaction. Some were grabbing bags to puke in, clearly new flyers, while others were excitedly counting the seconds as we kept on going higher. I wasn't sure which category I fit in, but I was ready for the flight to stop its rush into the heavens. The plane shook again as we reached what I assumed was the highest altitude, and the light above my seat told me I could move about the cabin freely. Immediately, I turned to Isabel to get some clear understanding of what to expect, only to find she had already unbuckled and left to the third-class cabin. I sighed in frustration, trying to get the attention of a stewardess, but the women were now standing towards the front, like statues, unblinking and looking on towards us. It was bizarre, but exactly what I expected in this sort of thing. I took a few breaths and calmed down, reminding myself that I should be trying to enjoy the experience as I saw the curtain behind the stewardesses open and a woman wearing a geisha dress and kabuki mask enter, dancing amid the aisle towards my row. Immediately, the Asian man next to me tensed up. I saw his face had a look of panic. Is this someone he knew? Had the flight personnel secretly allowed them to board? Was he in danger? The woman got closer and then bowed respectfully towards me, clearly wanting to sit beside the businessman. I'm not sure why, but I felt obligated to let her in and moved out towards the aisle. The businessman started to shout something in alarm and tried to unbuckle, then the woman straddled his lap. It almost looked like she wanted to make out with him as I watched her gently touch his face. He started to shout louder and I watched as the woman leaned in for a kiss. Someone squeezed my shoulder again and I turned to see Isabella standing there. Come with me, she ordered. I half wanted to see what would happen to the man that I was sitting next to, but I obeyed. 
clearly she knew more about this flight than me. As we entered third class, I found myself taking a moment to adjust to the darkness in the room. There weren't any windows back here, and the only dim light was coming from the screens on the back of each of the seats. Miniature flat-screen televisions that all the passengers were glued to like zombies. What is this? I whispered, worried that our voices would break some sort of trance. I believe they're doing something to them. Brainwashing or something. I'm not sure. I was hoping you can help me get the luggage in the compartment overhead, she said as we made it to the middle of the aisle. I noticed that the expression on the people's faces seemed contorted with terror or dread, as though whatever they were watching was driving them mad. Sure, but before I do that, I need you to be honest with me. Why are you really here? Isabel bit her lip and glanced towards the door. We don't have time for that. The stewardesses will be here any moment, so can you help me break this open or not? I huffed and looked at the lock, realizing that I actually did have something that could open it up. Yeah, sure. Let me get back to my luggage. Isabella told me to hurry as I returned to economy class and saw the stewardess were now removing something from the seat near me. It looked like the shriveled up remains of the businessman. It looked like... a corpse. Mr. Declan, your in-flight movie is about to start, the first stewardess said as I noticed that now there was a mini-TV in front of my seat as well. Wait, had that always been here? What happened to the man sitting beside me, I asked. I now noticed there was seemed to be red, dark stains on the seat. Blood. It's best for you to keep your journey to yourself, and not worry about others, the stewardess said with a pleasant smile. She stood there, waiting for me to comply with her instructions. Hesitantly, I sat down and put on the headphones, Everything about this was beginning to grow increasingly stranger and stranger. Not what I signed up for at all. As I activated the screen in front of me, a burst of white noise pierced my ears, and I nearly knocked the headphones off. Then, crashing waves filled the screen, and I froze. What I was seeing didn't seem possible. It showed me memories of my time as a child near the beach. Memories I'd never shared with anyone. I watched in amazement as I saw my own mother in the waves. This was the moment that she had taken her own life, I thought. A secret that I had wanted to take to my grave. How could this flight know? The noise grew louder as I heard whispers amidst the waves. Something was speaking to me, telling me its own secrets. Chills ran down my spine as every moment played out exactly as I remembered it. My mother was just just walking into the water, unconcerned with my cries as the waves crashed over her body. The whispers got louder. It sounded just like her. Join me, it croaked. Then shots rang out amid the cabin. I jolted back to reality and saw Tom entering economy class, waving a pistol about. The stewardess was his victim. Her lifeless body sprawled in the aisle in front of me, except... Except there was no blood. She just... She just looked like a mannequin now. What the hell, man? I shouted, standing up as he neared my seat. Don't let him harvest you, Max. You're too good for that. We can make it through this together, but you have to help me, you hear? He said. Other passengers were screaming as he waved the gun around, warning them to stay back. The hell is wrong with you? They're bloody frightened of you, I shouted. It's exactly what they want you to think. Now take me to that stupid chick you talked to earlier. The frequent flyer, he ordered. I raised my hands up defensively, and we walked together toward third class. Look, okay, wh wh whatever this is, it's, it's not... These are just actors, I told him as we entered the dark room. Even when I said that, I didn't fully believe it. Something deep in the pit of my stomach told me that none of this was normal. I planned to use the sudden shift in light to take advantage of him, but I never made it that far. Instead, the entire plane started to shake due to turbulence, and he lost his gun. It slid across the floor as he fell on me, and I shouted to Isabella to find it. She obeyed, and I turned to punch Tom straight in the jaw as the lights in the cabin began to flicker. Then all the passengers around us started to convulse and go into shock, seemingly being driven to a stroke due to the sudden power loss. Amid the chaos, somehow, Isabella found the weapon and aimed it towards me. Tom had already produced a knife, and I shouted for her to shoot him. Instead, 
She aimed at the luggage compartment over our heads. A single bullet caused the lock to blast off and several small bags fell, causing Tom's knife to become lodged in my shoulder. Shit, I said, as I looked across at some of the passengers, begging them to help. Instead, they were beginning to attack each other. One man was mauling out his son's eyes and eating them. A woman was digging straight into her face, trying to rip skin off, and two children were smashing each other in the stomach constantly with sharp forks. Any hope I had that this was all in act died at that moment. Isabella scrambled to search amidst the bags as Tom got his bearings. Then she found what she was looking for. It looked like a small briefcase. Don't! Tom shouted. I frowned, trying to figure out what the hell was happening as she put in the correct key code and the latches unbolted. Inside were six vials filled with yellow serum. She grabbed one and rushed towards the Aussie. I crawled out of the way into one of the seats as she lunged and pierced his neck, forcing the needle in all the way. I saw Tom's eyes dilate and then go completely black. And he fell to the floor unconscious. I snatched up his knife, just in case things got crazier from here. It was a smart call. Before I got a chance to even ask Isabella what the hell she was doing, she was through the curtain to economy class. I slowly stood up, trying to catch my breath, when one of the mutilated passengers grabbed a hold of me, forcing me to stare into its hollow, sunken eyes. There wasn't even a face there anymore, just, just a maw with endless teeth. Somehow, somehow they had transformed into nightmarish beings. I pushed it away and tumbled over Tom to get back to economy class, pausing between the two cabins to go into the restroom. Small room felt so much more claustrophobic than usual as I locked the door and looked at my reflection in the mirror. Splashing water on my face, I tried to get a hold of myself and chanted, It's all in your head, Max. It's all in your head. I gripped the sink for a minute and felt my breathing return to normal, hoping that maybe I was able to come back to normalcy. And then I noticed something shimmer in the mirror. I looked at it for a short moment, frowning in concern. Then my reflection smiled wickedly towards me. A second later, a strong icy hand emerged from the mirror and gripped my neck. I was gasping for breath as I felt my reflection strangle me, and I reached into my pocket where Tom's knife was still hidden away. I sliced it across the doppelganger's arm, causing strange black slime to bleed out from him as he loosened his grip and I escaped to the main cabin. I was still trying to make heads or tails of what was happening when I caught sight of the twins. After all that had just happened, I could hardly remember their names. Riley... Tanya? All I knew for sure was they were both covered in blood, hobbling towards me with heads, knives in their hands, having carved off each other's skulls, blocking my way to first class. I could hear Isabella shouting something to a stewardess as I looked back towards third class. The jetliner was shaking violently again, and I heard the captain announce something overhead. Attention, esteemed guests. We are entering a rough patch and advise you to buckle up, he said, in a voice that sounded too excited for the coming maelstrom. Suddenly, I was thrust to the ceiling. The twins fell upward as well, their bloody bodies toppling like ragdolls as I found myself unable to avoid sliding into them. The airliner shook, and I slowly moved towards the aisle where this all began, trying desperately to regain my footing. Then I heard a large growl from the third-class cabin. I shouldn't have looked. Tom's head peered out of the curtain, but what followed it was not human. It had a long neck like a giraffe without skin and legs that were as wide as the entire cabin, stretching out towards passengers and stepping on them like ants. The legs had mouths like a Venus flytrap, shrieking as the strange creature twisted its body like a contortionist. It clung to the ceiling, Tom's pure black eyes looking straight at me as his chest opened up and hundreds of miniature spidery creatures skittered towards me. Holy shit! Isabella shouted as she entered the room. Tom leapt towards her, shrieking as his mandibles ripped into her chest. The plane started to level again, and I moved down to my seat, desperately trying to find some way off. All I could think to do was break the window. I still had Tom's knife, and my rattled brain told me to give it a try. Reaching towards the window, I raised it up, even as I heard Isabella scream for me to stop. I was expecting to see the darkness of the night. Instead, it was a blinding light hitting me right in the face as I covered my eyes and tried to hit the window. I heard the glass crack, and I kept going as hard as I could. Suddenly, the screams in the cabin were replaced by a roar of a void. Whatever was beyond the window, I had managed to reach it, and now we were all about to be sucked out. I gripped my seat as hard as I could as alarms began to blare. Tom's gargantuan body was the first to go. It was like watching a camel being shoved through a needle hole. His face contorted, and I heard the breaking of bones. 
He tried to grab a hold of me, his tongue lapping out and sliding against my face as I heard him mindlessly groan. His front claw grabbed at my hand and I lost my grip, my legs hitting the shattered glass as I felt the roar of the plane against my body. It felt like I was a puppet being dragged by a massive child. I was gripping the window, looking towards the heavens. I can't describe the impossible things I saw in that sky. This was not our Earth, not our reality. It was... It was like a kaleidoscope of universes, crashing into one another, exploding in rainbows of color that I couldn't comprehend. From the endless ethereal streaks of light and dark, massive tentacles wrapped around the plane like vines, suffocating it. I could see something just beyond the horizon. A maw, the jaws of eternal damnation themselves, ready to swallow me whole. Isabella reached out the window to grab my hand and struggled to pull me in. I was lost in the gaze of eyes of the demonic entity that awaited us. As soon as I was inside, I saw that she had another serum prepared, this time for me. You really should have taken that pill, bud. She warned as she stabbed me in my arm before I could get a chance to react. The world spun. I saw her face begin to melt away. In its place, first was the twins growing two necks and forming a single monster to grin devilishly at me. Then it faded and showed the geisha woman, except this time her kabuki mask was made of flesh, the remains of her husband. Her long, claw-like fingernails dragged at my chest as she removed the mask and I saw my own mother. Her lifeless eyes locked with my own as I fell into a deep ocean of sleep. I can't remember what happened next. Felt like I was having an out-of-body experience. I was above the plane now, watching as the tentacles of the monster crushed it and swallowed it whole. The shrieks of passengers, not just hundreds, but millions from all across reality, being fed into this hungry monster's jaws. Then I was back in my seat. The unfasten your seatbelt sign flashed on and I gripped my cushion looking towards the Asian businessman who was now seemingly alive. How, how was I alive? I looked down at my arm, rubbing the place where Isabella had injected me. It still felt sore. This hadn't been a dream. I realized as I looked around the cabin. The overhead intercom came on again. Attention passengers, we're about to arrive at our destination. Please remain seated to enjoy the full experience. I felt a squeeze on my shoulder. And then Isabella whispered in my ear, Everything you just experienced is real. It just hasn't happened here yet. You need to find Tom and get off this flight now. I was about to turn to her when she squeezed my sore spot harder and snapped at me. Don't look back. Don't hesitate. Just run. Then she passed me a gun. Was it the same one that Tom had used earlier? I wasn't sure. My heart starts pumping fast as I unbuckled and moved towards first class. The stewardesses were there blocking my way. For some reason, I knew they would try to stop me, so I swung the hammer of the weapon straight towards the left one. The two of them slammed into each other, and it sounded like two dummies collapsing against one another in a store. I pushed past them to enter the first class. Most of the passengers here were rich upper class, just like any other normal flight. But as I moved down the aisle, I couldn't help but to notice the color was drained from their faces. They were trapped in their seats, unable to move. I reached towards one man, trying to wake him up, and his skin became as brittle as ash. They're husks, a voice said in front of me. I turned to look to see a man standing there, wearing a pilot uniform, but nothing about him made me feel that he was human. He might have been once, but now... All that remained was this memory. What are you doing to them? I asked, my voice trembling as I searched the cabin for Tom. Isabella's warning was ringing in my head, but I still needed to know more. Only what they signed up for. What you've already experienced. You've cheated, Max. Seen the end of the journey and managed to make it back. But it doesn't matter. The fear we can harvest from your soul is endless. You'll never truly leave this flight, he said, 
taking a step towards me. I clenched my fists and cocked the weapon towards him, letting loose a few rounds into his body. It didn't deter the specter. Not even sure why I tried after all I'd seen. But it did get Tom's attention. He stood up and moved towards me. What are you doing, man? You want to get us both killed? He shouted. I looked towards the gun, my hand shaking as I saw a scar was beginning to form on my arm. How had I gotten there? I think we might already be dead, I said, passing him the weapon. The ghost pilot was gone temporarily, but Tom warned it wouldn't matter. God, God, my head hurts. That drug really did a number on me, he said, rubbing the spot where Isabella had injected him. How is any of this possible, I said. My mouth dry as he led me back through to economy class. This time I saw my doppelganger again, sitting there staring out the window and watching as the jetliner began to shake again. Tom was rattling off an explanation or an interpretation of events to me as we moved. From what I understand, the plane moves beyond the realm of space and time that we know, past the horizon into a new endless dimension, one where pure chaos is born. The people, if they are that, who run this contraption, they're feeding a creature, trying to birth it into reality. This reality that we know of, it, it's growing stronger, Max. Every new flight is harvesting more memories of reality and fear into it, he said. We were almost to the back of the plane now. No one had stopped us. His explanation made some sense to me as we stood there, and he started to look among the things before commenting. You probably have a dozen other questions about this mess, like... How I know all this and why Isabella, if that is her real name, is helping us. I don't know. I came on board for my wife. She boarded a flight three years ago. I'm gonna find her. He paused and passed me the weapon along with a parachute. But that isn't how your journey ends, Max. You got a chance to get out. Warn the world if you can. Just don't worry about me. If your wife is trapped here, you'll need to get her the serum that we both took. He nodded, nodding me adieu as he left to search the plane. The luggage compartment was oddly silent as the jetliner shook again and I put on the backpack. I slowly walked towards the back of the plane, near to where the landing gear was stored. It would be the safest place to jump, I realized. I crouched down and gently kicked at the shutters beneath the gear, wondering how strong they were. Then I heard a faint whisper. Someone was there with me. Instinctively, I jolted and cocked the weapon. Show yourself. From amid the luggage, I saw a shadow move and slither towards me. Eventually, it formed a shape. The ghost pilot. No. It was... It was a doppelganger of my own mother. Don't come any closer, I warned her. Her eyes looked watery and full of pain. Max, it's me. Unreal. This is real, all of it, she whispered to me. It can't be. You're dead, I shouted back. I saw you die. That was just one way my journey ended. It doesn't have to be that way anymore, she said with a genuine smile. The journey has shown me so much. We can live together. Endless amounts of lives. I heard another rustle amidst the luggage. It was Isabella coming to check on me. Max, don't listen to her. You have to leave. You can't leave, Max. No one can. Board the flight. You're part of the ship. Another voice cackled amidst the rafters. My mother raised a welcoming hand towards me. This can be the life we never got together, she pleaded with me. I knew it was a trap. But it felt so inviting to be able to escape into an endless cacophony of realities where I could experience the love of a mom that I never knew. But none of it would be real. I steadied my aim and fired straight at her head. The shadow screamed and blurred into a thousand slithering eels as Isabella shouted for me to go. I turned and slammed my foot against the landing gear again and again. The black slime oozed towards me, the screeching eels rapidly closing in for a chokehold. Then finally the metal gave way and I could see clouds beneath my feet. Come with me, I shouted to Isabella. After all she had done for me, it felt like helping her was the right thing to do. It's too late for me. I'm part of the ship already, but I'll be here to help people get off every damn time. She responded. 
I reached for her, ignoring her insistence that she was doomed, but instead... Instead, the shadows ensnared her, and I watched as black slime poured into her eyes and mouth. The shadow began to eat away at her body, and I knew... I had to leave. Crawling down to the landing gear, the rush of air beneath the plane was overwhelming. I heard the screams from the flight roar, and I didn't hesitate this time. I jumped. Spiraling into the air, I heard the roar of white noise and looked up to see an empty sky. Like it had never been there at all. The force of my fall began to increase and I pulled at my parachute cord, feeling it tug and jolt me up into the air. And then... Everything began to slow. I was drifting in the atmosphere. Gradually I made my way to the surface, tumbling about in the soft ground as I got my bearings. I was back at the airfield. Standing up, I checked my watch and realized that not a minute had passed since I boarded. I shook off the parachute and I stumbled towards the road, watching as some cars approached. I covered my eyes as one car parked in front of me and a man dressed as a British explorer stepped out. What the devil have you just been through, my good man? He added, clearly startled at my appearance. I saw a couple behind him holding tickets, apparently awaiting an upcoming flight. I opened my mouth to warn them, and then I saw a familiar face in the crowd. Isabella. I moved towards her, grabbing a hold of her arm and muttering, Are you real? Is this... is this real? Hey, hands off! What's gotten into you, bud? She said, shaking me off like she didn't know me. I still felt like my head was spinning. You're here for full moon flight. I asked, trying to understand and carefully choose my words. Yeah, first time. I heard there a scream. You bet on one yourself? Isabella asked. I didn't see a hint of deception in her eyes. Slowly I nodded, reaching into my pocket and passing her the pills she had given me right before I boarded. Only she hadn't done that yet. Do you need this for the trip? I told her. She gave me a look of puzzlement, and I walked off without another word. I knew there was nothing I could say to even explain how I understood her role now for this. A moment later, I felt a rush of wind, and the dark jetliner appeared right behind the hangar bay, like it had done before. A journey into the unknown, an experience like no other. That's what the review says. That isn't what mine's going to say. This is my review for Full Moon Flights. Don't believe the hype. This event is a killer. And you don't want to become a frequent flyer. Like me. Hey guys, I just want to make sure that all of you take a look in the description down below for multiple different reasons. The main reason I'm talking about right now, though, is to look at the author's links. Every time that I do a story on one of these platforms, I post links from the authors. Some of them are books that the authors put out. If you like the stories that you hear, then I highly, highly encourage you to go scroll down, take a look in the description, click one of those links. If you like that author, I guarantee you they have something else that you're going to like. And if they have a book out there, you're going to love that book. I mean, hell, that's how Tales from the Gas Station became what it is, okay? If you guys heard it on on YouTube, then hey, there are more, bigger, better versions of it out there that you can get on Amazon or Audible or No Sleep or what have you. So for reals, uh, the, scroll down, check out the links. And that's not like an advertisement thing. I'm just like, look, you're, this is for your benefit. Check it out. And as always, I want to give a very big thank you to everybody who supports me on Patreon. Thank you so much. A very big thank you to Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Stephanie Butler, Reaper61167, Bobby Carmen, Tristan Pelton, Chance Burnett, Diana Krause, Dickie McQuicky, Sam High, Crusader Chocobo, Spooky Shell, Adam Maros, Grand Moth the Milky, Big Smoke 369, Captain Scurvy, Salty Irish Poet, Esteban, Raiden Morris, Nate Cull, Horror Fan 1212, Hour Minute Second Time, Kyle Resnack, David Martin, Scarrington the Unkempt, Robert Malcolm, Angelus, Spanky, Snoochie Boochie, Seclude, Lupita Galvin, That Creepy Chick, Tyler Fletcher, Merxenum, Red Shadow Cat, Xavier the Cheyenne, Demix, Sean Catabaker, Six Gay Rats in a Trench Coat, Turtle Man, Rob Like Sharp Things, Cryolinian, Xavier Graphius, Lord Life's Best, Goring from Magazine, Maria Walker, Emily Mitchell, Crazy Kid, Mr. Marcus Blitz, Eka Limchok, Dirt Diver, o Rio, Matt Bach, Voice of Sand, Coffee Zombie, Hidden Tiger, Shelly J, Jeremy H, Psychomel, Nana, The Leader Account, Melted Lake, Tali Sue, William King, Darth Miver, Michael Ortiz, Satanic Aries, Bardo Hawk 764, Lambda M98, Harley, Sashi Sazaku, Cronut 509, Kaylee Ambrose, Suji Campbell, Stricken, Freddy Krueger, Happy Birthday Jason Wilson, Lisa Cottrell, Caspian, Hades Nephew, Tater Chip, Acid System, Prozac and Pancake Appreciation Society, Benjamin Welverick, Cryptic Nightmares, Kiri the Sloth, Fester's Lampshade, Sky Harbor, Nico Kyle, Raphael Rodriguez, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, Daniel Polson, and Corey Kenshin. As always, thank you guys so, so much.
because you guys help me do everything that I do here. You guys help pay authors for stories and commission stories and do everything that I can do to make this channel and make this podcast the best it could possibly be. So thank you all for supporting me here. And as always, everyone, sweet dreams.